Hello, my name is Stefan Pielmeier. I'm the CTO of Sternula, delivering your maritime services to all VDES terminals worldwide through VDESAT. Today, I would like to guide you through the history coming from the very first communication media we used between chips through AIS and then further on to VDES. So how did that all start? In the beginning of ship communication and identification there were flags uh, that started in the 1500s after Christ and until today we use flags to identify the flag state of a ship. Um, in between we also have developed possibilities to communicate with flags between ships but that um, yeah, always required a line of sight and daylight and so on. So in about 1900, um, there was the wonderful invention of the radio and that made it possible to communicate it over long distances using the Morse code. Uh, in 1912, when the Titanic sunk, that was used and the Morse code was used still into the 1970s. Its use was mainly for distress communication, so when a ship was in, in high danger to sink or when there was life at risk. In 1988 uh, GMDSS was established by the IMO and then that was first there when the Morse code was becoming a little bit less important. However, in the 50s, um, the radar also was invented and the radar made it possible to um, show a dot on a map where a ship would be. But identification of the ship is still difficult because we never standardized, in fact, a way that the ship would answer back to the radar signal um, its correct identification. Um, well, there is of course technology that can do that, but it was never required to be implemented by all ships. So in 1986, uh, some clever people began to think about how can we implement a simple solution that every ship is broadcasting their identification all the time in a way that other ships can receive that identification. And there is a name interesting, Benny Pettersson from the Swedish Maritime Administration who invented what we today know as the Automatic Identification System, AIS. AIS was then uh, developed. There were many different prototypes, but finally in 1996, ITU started to draft what we today know as uh, the AIS specification under ITU. And um, in 1997, uh, the necessary frequencies were assigned by the World Radio Conference. And in December 2000, IMO approved a change of the requirements to all big ships and passenger ships to carry an AIS from 2002 on. So during the next years after 2002, all ships were beginning to carry the AIS equipment because some of them were not new builds but old chips, so requirements came a bit later. And uh, the AIS came into existence. So what is AIS? AIS is a lot of different things. Um, if you look into the IEC standards, there is about 10 different kind of uses for AIS. Uh, AIS can be used, of course, as we know it, as an equipment or board of the ship to transmit position, uh, depths uh, of the ship, how, how, how deep it is in the water. Um, which cargo it's carrying, from where to where it's going, and so on. 
its current position and velocity all these kind of parameters however there is also base stations there is repeater stations there is man overboard devices and so on IEC has all that in their standards defined and these are performance standards so thanks to IEC we can put uh, a stamp on each of these AIS equipments and say this AIS equipment is approved according to IEC and uh, when, when you then look into the uh, maritime equipment standards that are issued by the flag states um, like for example the European Union you will see that they refer to these IEC specifications okay what do we ca what can we do now with AIS as we have it today there's about 220,000 terminals that have IAS and you can see on that map um, that we have a position of roughly every ship on the whole globe thanks to many satellites that are receiving these signals from each ship and uh, we can get a very clear picture of uh, where the assets where the cargo is so following the fleet estimating port arrival times um, but also being able to follow up after an accident if one of the ships tries to disappear in the fog or creates a damage to some assets and just sails away all this is is locked by AIS so has given us a very good transparency um, however uh, AIS is not really secure mm, it can be disturbed it can be spoofed uh, so that this may be a limitation we see more and more often um, and it's not able to carry these new e-navigation services that IMO wants to get deployed into the whole maritime field in order to enhance security and uh, environment protection so what do we do we cannot um, use the AIS channels for more uh, these two channels um, both 25 kilohertz are completely filled up in several regions of the world so finally we um, decided to look into how can we expand the system by keeping the AIS as it is because it's a very good thing um, but also adding some more functionalities in order to enable the e-navigation services that IMO wants to be able to use in the future. Um, IMO has defined a need for e-navigation in 2008 and finally in 2008 that's exactly the same Ayala started to uh, make a committee on investigating what can we do in order to develop the VHF data exchange system VDES and gradually these uh, proposals were being sent to ITU and we are now in a state in 2020 where ITU is reviewing uh, the latest proposals and where we are close to being able to um, present a new version of the 2092 VDES standard okay so VDES what is that um, it's a flexible VHF data exchange system so it includes AIS it includes what we know from AIS these small application specific messages but now there is two extra channels so these messages do not block the AIS channels anymore and we have some extra channels that allow us to transport around 100 kilobit in some cases up to 300 kilobit terrestrial and satellite uh, data connections so we have a new channel that is much broader than what AIS can deliver um, and it's message based so <clears throat> we should not expect video streaming but we can do quite enhanced digital data exchange yes uh, there's a few pictures here 
um, looking at the connectivity enhancement, whereas the good old AIS mainly was terrestrial, but just could be listened to by the satellite. Now we are able to include the VDS enabled satellites to be able to also downlink some information. So now it's a two-way communication to ships through the good old VHF AIS antenna uh, that gives worldwide connectivity. So why should we invest in VDS? Why should we use VDS? First of all, it's a global standard, it's developed by IALA, it's requested by IMO, it's anchored in ITU, um, and it's completely transparent. There will be maybe even open source implementations of some of the protocols. So it's possible to have a very healthy competition out there around this standard. It's not proprietary. Um, additionally, it is supported already by key equipment manufacturers. So your equipment manufacturer you have today on your ships is probably right now designing a new product that is VDES enabled, an AIS transceiver that is VDES enabled. And the other important part is, as we have already these AIS terminals out there, and VDES is just a small step from AIS, enabling a lot of extra communication possibilities, you can expect that these AIS terminals will be exchanged with VDES terminals on the ships over the next years, um, sometimes driven by the wish to be able to participate in these new e-navigation services, sometimes because old equipment is simply replaced with new equipment that is then by chance VDIS <coughs> enabled. So in about year 2030, we expect that there will be 500,000 terminals out there, not only for ships, also for boys, for other aids to navigation that have to be monitored and these 500 terminals can be connected globally and quite easy with an open standard. So that's the main argument why VDES is a success. Um, the other main argument is as AIS today is a carriage requirement on board of ships and IMO wants to enforce these e-navigation services in the future, we can expect that as VDES can deliver these e-navigation services, it might as well become a SOLAS carriage requirement. And that is, of course, what many organizations already vote for at IMO today. Today, we can see reports that cyber attacks are happening on board of ships through existing internet connections. Gladfully, the bridges of ships are normally not directly connected to the ship's uh, internet connection and therefore these attacks are not that critical for safety on board. But as we want to have these e-navigation services on board of ship, um, we need these data connections up to bridge equipment. Doing it through an internet connection has potential risks. Um, these can be handled, but that is known to be a complex task. VDIS, on the other hand, uh, does not connect you directly to the internet. It is based uh, in many parts on the internet protocol as such. So equipment can be connected by modern ways. However, the VDIS transport channel that is accessible for external attackers is not as open as the internet is. So VDIS should only transport uh, the services that are selected to be safe on shore side and that are subscribed to on the ship side. So this connection of these two kind of filtering mechanisms make it safe for the 
ship crew to use the services that are offered by VDIS because they know these are maritime services, uh, they have no viruses attached and so on. Uh, plus the ship crew can or needs in fact to subscribe to the services before uh, their computer equipment actually will display the data. VDIS also enables uh, the possibility to sign data. So if you get a weather report from Denmark's Meteorological Institute on the ship equipment, you can check that the weather chart is really signed by Denmark's Meteorological Institute. It's the same mechanisms that are used uh, like for internet security. And finally, I would like to talk about the cost aspect of VDIS. As I said earlier, it's rather cheap for ship owners to um, convert from an AIS installation to a VDIS installation. It's basically only to exchange the transceiver. There is no new cables, there is no large energy consumption. Um, it's simply an AIS that is enabled for VDIS and most chips are equipped with that equipment today. For service providers, VDIS has many advantages because it provides a different way to connect to the ships that can optimize their revenue streams and simplify um, their connectivity contracts. And that is because normally the service provider would pay for the transport of the data and not the customer. That is also meaning the chip owners are not expected uh, to have to pay for uh, subscriptions, for data transfers. This is normally done by the service provider. There might so be services that are pay services, but then the ship owner will only pay for the service and the transport is just a part of it. Well, what did we achieve with VDIS up to now? Uh, we have in Ayala a guideline G1139 um, and we have trials that are run by many of the participants and members of Ayala in fact in order to prove that the things are working. We have a test standard that is coming and we have major equipment producers who prepare uh, products for VDES. In case you would like to know more about VDES and the details of the specifications where you can learn more if you want to develop products or if you just consider to be a service provider, if you want to be uh, a maritime authority that wants to provide services through VDIS in the future, you can go on our webpage stanula.com and learn more about our offerings for trainings and for test environments where you can test your services or your ship equipment in the future to become a part of the new and bright VDIS community. Thank you for today.